Hello, everyone. We'll just give it a few seconds while people get their audio connected uh, and tune in. Uh, but thank you again to everyone here joining us at Installer Festival, um, our, our third edition. Uh, now on our, on our third time, we're, we're bringing um, Rob Whitney uh, and Residio, and we're bringing a panel um, discussion to you here today where we are um, talking about decarbonisation and demand reduction and getting more efficient um, with our heating system. So we've covered a lot in the past, haven't we? Um, you know, Rob uh, and, and the guys are on looking at the future of heat and looking at uh, electrification and our sort of net getting to net zero before. But today we're focusing on the here and now. So there are millions of, of boilers and heating systems that are uh, out there today that can be easily improved to reduce consumption and reduce emissions just using today's technology. So that's really the focus is the practical sort of application of, of getting more efficient today. And we're bringing all sorts of different perspectives together in this discussion. Um, so uh, I'll introduce it very briefly. We have Rob Whitney from, from Residio, Rich Burrows from Mid Wales Plumbing and Heating Supplies, um, Rob Berridge from Heat Engineer, Kim Betty from Heating Academy in Northampton, and Joe Alsop from The Heating Hub. So thank you so much uh, for joining us, guys. So we're bringing together here manufacturers, merchants, installers, and trainers. And I think we're gonna cover about four key themes, and I'm gonna introduce Rob in a second, but we're gonna look at system sizing and choosing, and tuning, sorry. We're gonna look at choosing the right controls. We're gonna look at reducing demand and waste, and then training and best practice. And we're gonna cover about 20, 25 minutes of getting the panelists' perspectives, and then we're opening the floor to, to you all and getting questions from, from you guys. And, and, and really, that this is up to up your time as well. So uh, we're looking forward to those. So Rob, thanks so much for, for joining, and let me just um, hand over to you for, for the first minute or two. Yeah, great, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, as Ben just explained, we, this is the third of these installer panels that we've done. Um, and previously we've looked at sort of where things are going over the next sort of 5, 10, 15 years. And we've also looked at some of the mega trends that are happening um, under electrification, things like heat pumps. For this one, we really wanted to, to look at where we are today and, and the challenges of today and the opportunities of today. What we can do with the boilers that we've got installed today and systems and really how we can make them operate better because there's been lots of discussion on the forums recently about um, a campaign called Killer Kilowatt, where we've been looking at opportunities to um, right size the boilers and to tune the systems a bit better so that big savings can be achieved in, in, uh, in gas consumption. So really what today's themes is, is all about is, is the different ways that we can look at systems that are being installed today and, and existing systems that are already there and just with very simple changes in working practices um, and some better controls, um, how large amounts of energy can be, be saved in, in everyone's homes. And from the initial work that we've done, um, there's, a, there's a lot of wastage that's going on and it will vary depending on the property. Um, but some, from some research and from some testing we've done, we've seen there's, there's opportunities to save one or two kilowatt hours of, of gas consumption per day per home. So it all adds up to a massive, massive uh, waste that's, that's happening today. And, and today is all about looking at ways we can avoid that waste. Brilliant, thanks, thanks Rob. Let me bring in um, the other Rob, uh, just opposite on the screen from, from Heat Engineer and talk about, talking about waste, you know, how can we, uh, yeah, the installers listening today learn more about doing uh, heat loss calculations, learn more about that sort of, you know, reduce ways to, to reduce that waste. Sure, well, um, hi everybody. Um, I've been talking about uh, the fact that we've got a wastage crisis for a few years now, as opposed to an energy crisis that we keep getting um, stuff down our throats. But, you know, I, I think that there's, <laughs> historically, there's kind of been a, a, a sort of ignorance of responsibility of what we need to do within an industry. And it's only, really i think in the last few years that certainly the uk um installers engineers and architects and surveyors etc are now actually sort of like perking the ears up and thinking well actually we probably could do with, with doing something about this and then you ask yourself the question that the only thing that we really have to do the very first crucial part of that is to quantify 
the energy requirement for these properties. And this is where we've had the issues that we've just had pretty predominantly a kind of gas boiler market that has has, uh, has taken sort of, you know 90% or 95% of all of the sales and, and, the, and the installs. Um, and there's essentially a one size fits all. Um, and we know, the engineer, you know, engineers uh, that, you know, that, that are amongst the UK, some of the finest in the world, you know, we've always known that there's, this, is, this is not the case. We don't need, you know, we, we have um, you know, an actual average um, need of heat of between six and eight kilowatts. And yet we're buying plant that is, is so far in advance of that, you know, higher than that, that we're not, we're not doing, uh, you know, we're, we're not actually getting the right size plant in the first place. And so I think the very, very first port call that we need to be doing is actually doing the heat loss calculations, which uh, we've proven through our software now, we've produced thousands of reports that basically state that, you know, the, the, the requirement is, is next to nothing on, on most properties. It really is not a lot at all. And so therefore we can have as many controls as we as we would like to to control the, these these uh, these systems but i think predominantly we've got to start demanding smaller output units and and start heating for a longer time so we as a company we, you know, we're trying to do our best in the in that field um and in fact today i can i can just give you the scoop here but today we've literally just launched live about an hour ago our free um online uh, heat loss estimator tool now that's for everybody everyone can use it um, really, really user friendly. Um, it is in the beta stage of testing. So please guys, anyone that's listening, go and have a go, just sign onto our website and just go and have a go, but try and break it and soon come back and come back to us and let us know if you, if you do it. But my message is very, very clear. We don't need anywhere near the heat that we've been putting in. So get a calculation, which now with a free thing like this is available to everybody to do, to do exactly what they want. There's no real excuse to, you know, to go to that point. And you know, it kind of brings on really to the next point. I think you said Kim was going to be talking next. It, it falls perfectly into, into his lap of, of once you've got that calculation, how do you then get all your pipe work and all of your plant size to exactly what it should be to make that system run correctly? Okay. We'll go, we'll go, we'll go to Kim next. Um, I'll just, just people who want to ask questions, do type them into the Q and a, or the chat here so that we can sort of pick them up and we'll um, answer as many as possible um, once we've just introduced all the panelists. But Kim, do you want to sort of pick up on, on that point that Rob teed up there? Yeah, hi. So I, of course, agree absolutely with Rob. We can't do anything unless we know what we need to, to play with to start with. Um, one of the other issues, I think, is that the general, con the, the general ability of knowledge of people have on condensing and what we actually need to achieve to make our boilers condense uh, hasn't been very well explained. Um, I think a lot of people think it's just a magic switch. You get to condensing mode and then suddenly it's condensing and we're saving all this energy. If we don't get our return temperature down, the boiler isn't even going to begin to condense. Uh, most combi boilers set temperature is about 75. Our return temperature is going to be about 55. And the chance of that boiler condensing ever, unless it's got compensation controls on, it's not going to happen. We have to set the boiler at 75 for when it's minus two outside. And obviously because of the size radiators that we're picking up on, we're picking up on old technology radiators. So they're sized for that sort of flow temperature. But if we can't, uh, if we can't get our balancing right, I ask a lot of guys, what are we balancing? Nobody really seems to know what we're balancing to what. It's an expression that we use, but nobody really knows sort of what they're doing. And we need, we need to balance the flow coming out of the boiler to the flow requirement of the system. If we overflow it, where does that energy go? Well, it's going to go back to the boiler. Our return temperature is going to go up, so on and so forth. Uh, the information to, to learn this stuff is not difficult. The Sibsi book isn't very good. It, it's not very helpful. It's not bedtime reading. It's been written by sort of university postgraduates. Most of us would look at it and think it's sort of got written in gobbledygook. Uh, so what I've tried to do is to, is to take out the interesting parts of that, the bits relevant to uh, balancing, um, and put it in some sort of plain English that the installers can understand because we only need a couple of very simple schoolboy maths formulas to get this right. We can work out the flow we need. Once Rob set us up with the amount of heat, heat loss that we've got, we can work out the flow we need. We can adjust the right amount of flow to the right radiators. We can make sure that our return temperatures are correct. Uh, and then, of course, if we go down the control route, I'm sure Richard will be talking about controls in a bit, we can get our, our flow temperatures down. It's, and it's all about getting our return temperature down. I can't believe that we can't do this on S and Y plans yet, uh, unless we go for priority hot water. At the moment, S and Y plan, if we swap the boiler on that, then bless it, it's got no chance of condensing at all. 
I have no idea how many millions of SMY plan boilers are out there, but there's an awful lot of them, and I doubt any of them uh, condense at all, apart from when they're warming up and when they're crawling down. So there is the potential there for, for as, as the killer kilowatt thing uh, is suggesting, for saving millions and millions and millions of kilowatt hours a year. If we can just understand condensing a bit more and tweak the boilers and get the appropriate controls on so that we can achieve it. And so talking about con controls, picking up on that, on that, Kim, I will bring Rich in, Rich in now, if you'd like to just um, come and sort of introduce uh, yourself, Rich, and uh, a couple of, couple of questions for you. One is, um, you know, choosing the right controls and, you know, also want to talk about, want to talk a bit about zoning, you know, and is that expensive? Is that complicated? And also uh, boiler tuning, um, you know, right. share a bit of insight with that for, for installers yeah. as well. I'd, I'd love to, Ben. So basically, with condensing technology boilers, we need to be rethinking our control strategies a little bit. So I've got some examples here. So these are sort of the controls we're all kind of used to. Um, these are sort of the historical controls that we used to fit in on boilers. Unfortunately, with condensing boilers, if we're fitting on-off controls like TPI control or on-off clicky stats, the problem with that is that the boiler isn't maximized for its efficiency. So what I mean by that is when you set a boiler to 75 degrees Celsius, then the boiler with an on off control will always run at 75. And then if you haven't it, it well, even if you try and balance at 75 flow temp, the best you're going to achieve is a DT 20 across the system. If you can achieve that, which means your, your return temperatures are going to go come back at higher than condensing temperatures. So if we go from something like this, we come over to the new sort of wave of controls like T4. So T4 is actually a, what we call a class five control. So the T4 control uh, basically allows the boiler to adjust its flow temperature. So instead of being 75 degrees all the time, we can actually, this, the controller can work out the heat loss from inside the building. So where we kind of use weather compensation, which is what we would classify as an ERP class six control, which uses an external air temperature reference. What these guys do on ERP class five control is they basically, they learn the in, inside warm up and cool down periods of the building. And then they will adjust the flow temperature of the boiler to suit the heat loss that it can see in the way that the rooms heat and cool. So what we, what we can have now is say a boiler that, that would have been run at 75 degrees Celsius, having a higher return temperature coming back, it can now run at say 50 degrees or 45 degrees flow temperature, which means the return temperature from that system is coming back a lot, lot cooler. So this is kind of your single zone product, modulation control technology. Um, it, it's kind of what we're used to, but the difference is in this kind of category is we're actually now allowing the boiler to um, have have modulation control. So if we go from that, and I just pick up on, on a couple other things. So we can go to the sort of the next level, which is kind of smart zoning. Um, so this is now fitting TRVs on all the radiators and actually having the demand of each individual room uh, as an amalgamation of information, which then the boiler then changes its output dependent on. So there's two types of technology. So up to 150 square meters under the current regulations, we we allowed a, a single zone controller over 150 square meters. We're looking at multi zone control or smart zoning technology. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to come back to uh, Rob Whitney. Just you know, so installers, you, there's probably a lot of different technologies that are out there. You know, in terms of choosing what's best here and choosing the right controls. You know, for the right house, the right situation, the right customer. Um, how do how do, how does someone go about? Choosing what's well, best. Well, there's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, Ben. <laughs> I mean, the, um, the the answer I give to that is that first of all, you need, the installer would need to have a discussion with their customer mm. uh, and really agree what type of system is going in or what's there already. Look at the control strategy and and look at the type of boiler because the type of controls that will be fitted will will depend on the boiler as well. You know, and whether it's a storage system or a combi system has a big, big effect. Um, some customers want simple controls. You know? mm. um, we've got a legacy in the UK of having separate time clocks and separate sats. Um, and the good news is, is the more modern controls that, that Rich has just referred to that, that uh, enable the flow temperature of the boiler to be reduced and the power output of the boiler to be reduced. 
Um, they're available and have been available for a, a long, long time in these simple um, control interfaces. So um, every job's unique, you know, even if you had two identical homes next to each other, um, the way the home is lived in and the customer's patterns will all have an impact on which controls are, are chosen. So really mm -hmm. what I would encourage is that for the installers to um, get hands on with the products, you know, come on our, on our training sessions when we start them up again, um, come on our live, um, live training courses, and critically to, uh, to get them installed in their own homes. You know, get used to these uh, enhanced controls and additional features that you get because once you've experienced this for yourself, you won't go back. Mm -hmm. you know, I, okay. I changed my boiler system from a, an on-off control to an open firm control four or five years ago and, and the benefits are massive. You know, it, it runs a lot quieter, loses a lot less fuel, um, there's less servicing to do on the appliance. It condenses all the time. Um, and these are all standard off-the-shelf stuff that exists today that installers can use and, and save their customers hundreds and hundreds of kilowatt hours mm. worth of gas every year. Good to see and good to see yourself drinking your own medicine there, Rob. I did a panel there back in the yeah. Net Zero Festival and they, um, yeah. what people had actually had in their own homes was sometimes different to what we spout about. But I'm going to come on to the kind of, I think one of the key questions here, um, you know, bringing in, in Joe now is, we're going to move on to sort of reducing demand, you know, redu uh, reducing waste. You know, isn't this really the customer's problem? And, you know, what's the role of the installer perhaps uh, in this? You know, obviously you can go and get educated sort of on all the products, but um, I'd love to get your, your thoughts here now, Jay. Yeah, well, um, in principle, I think consumers do need to engage with their heating systems more. Um, we've all got used to being quite passive consumers of heat mm. and, and we take it for granted. Um, but I think consumers need better data and they need better guidance to make meaningful improvements. Um, most, most consumers, for example, would believe that their, their new boiler is 92 or 94% efficient out of the box. <clears throat> and there's not really a lot of people in the industry that would set them straight on that. So if that's their belief, why do they even know that they have to do anything different? Um, I think the rise in smart controls does show that consumers do want to um, engage with their heating systems, do exercise greater control over them um, in order to reduce their gas consumption. Um, oh yeah, we, we want to save some money, don't we? That's what we, we want to save some money. But <laughs> the problem is, is that, um, as we all know, many third party um, smart controls, which is you know, where consumers want to invest, um, will often only operate the boiler on an on-off basis, mm. as, as Richard described, um, unless the boiler is open therm compatible and unless the installer knows to set the control up on the open therm protocol. Therefore, their investment in the smart control might only produce a, a, you know, a marginal improvement in efficiency. Um, what consumers don't know is that when they select a third party smart control that cannot modulate the boiler, is they're actually having to compromise on their efficiency when they believe that the, the opposite is true. So I think for consumers, it's, it's quite difficult for them to, to make the right choices even when they are engaged and they need better guidance on which control is right for their, for their home. And, and that's partly an installer knowledge thing, but I think the industry could do perhaps a little bit better to make their products mm. universally compatible. Um, and also the data on, on how their boiler is performing in the home once we, they've made those investments. I mean, I've blogged elsewhere that a really simple measure would be to put a digital display on the front of the boiler, shows an aggregated efficiency of that boiler based on its return temperature. Um, and likewise, kilowatt hours used, likewise, how much that costs based on, based on your cost of fuel. And this could all be set to the phone with some meaningful guidance that says, your condensing boiler spends 10% of its time in condensing mode. It should be, it should be X, you know, and, and therefore they're flagging up that, that something is, is quite wrong. Um, I think also a mandatory heat loss calculation and, and better boiler labeling would really help them make better choices um, mm. and, and get some, get some education around, around their heating system. Um, and also the, the efficiency potential of, around the modulation ratio, because, um, all boilers are a rated even ones that are one in three modulation ratios, but their ability to operate on, a, on an A-rated setting is, is really based on everything we've discussed, discussed here, that the boiler sizing is right, the control is right, everything, everything we've said so far is right, and that is just a, a complete unknown to the consumer. 
Mm, it's a bit of a mind fault, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but what, uh, Rob, you also mentioned something about, um, you know, is it the on off or, or start stop? And, and, you know, is that yeah. the optimum, optimum way uh, to, to sort of operate a boiler? What, Rob, what, what are your yeah, thoughts? So obviously there's all the conversation about the best way to control a boiler mm. and making sure that it's running at the right power output, make sure it's range rated down make sure your controls are all set up properly and the balancing is done, done right. Um, but then there's additional demand reduction activity that can be done on the control settings themselves. And, and there's a, a terminology called optimization or optimum start and stop. And really some of the modern controls, these have additional features that can be enabled. And, and basically they learn how quickly the, the house heats up and cools down. And instead of having those fixed on and off times, it will actually look at how quickly the house is heating up and cooling down. It will learn that and it will flex the start and stop times of the heating. So that on um, the time that you say in the morning, say 8 a.m., that you want to be comfortable, it will start the boiler at different times um, on different days of the year to make sure that you, you achieve that comfort without getting there too soon or, or too late. And, and that really helps people be comfortable because if you wake up one day in the middle of the winter and you find your heating's cold, you'll go to the time mm. clock and set it earlier, but then you won't ever change that and you're wasting energy. So all these little things add up. Um, so you do that at the start of the period, optimum start, and there's an optimum stop as well. Um, mm. That it looks at how the heat is decaying towards the end of the day. And then if it looks you know, half an hour before you're off time, it will find that it will only drop, have dropped by say half a degree by that time. It will stop running the boiler yeah and mm. all these little bits of energy at the start and the end of the, of the day they all add up and it's all about running the heating to comfort level when you want it and then onto a lower level a setback level when you don't need it mm. it will make so sense sort of um in theory it sounds it, it does sound great doesn't it let's um perhaps talk about the final kind of point that we think is is important here which is which is training isn't it you know it's like getting everyone up to uh, a standard both sort of education um but you know practically getting to grips with this um who wants to to, to go i don't know kim yeah, you're I, yeah nodding I'll nodding I'll that one. so so the, the issue is, is is how do we set this standard i mean at the moment everybody thinks the standard is what they're doing at the moment everything gets hot everybody's happy the customer's happy um uh, and no one is aware really of how little energy we aren't saving. I mean, yes, you hear stories of people's bills going down, which is great, but I'm sure they don't go down as much as they should do. And I'm sure it's only a few percent of people that get this sort of savings that they should be seeing. So how do we go about enticing the installer to want to do a better job? Because I think at the moment, most installers will say they're doing a great job anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we're the sort of select few on here that maybe understand that these things about return temperatures and all the rest of it, and, and, and the need to get our return temperatures down if we're going to have any chance to get the boiler to condense. So how how do we go? How do we do that? I mean, I, we're supposed to have the answers here, but I don't have the answers to That's, that one. Well, yeah, it's, it's put it out. Uh, well, put it out to, to some of the other panelists as well for some ideas. But I'd love to hear any anyone listening to this as well. Any anyone attending? Pop it in the chat in a question. You know what. Uh, get your reactions to, to that thought, but let's, um, let's ask some of the other, other folks we've got here on the panel. Um, Can I have a little go? Yeah, with Rob, that? please, go for it. Just, um, I've always tried to sort of like push the idea of a fabric first approach to, uh, to most things. You know, frankly, if we built properly in the first place, we, we, all of us sitting here wouldn't even be having this conversation mm. uh, because the heat wouldn't be leaking from the buildings. It's as simple as that. You know, we've got an opportunity at the moment with the Green Homes Grant, which I think, if I'm right, runs till March 2021. Um, at this stage, uh, people can go and do some very, very simple upgrades, whether they get the grant for putting some new windows in or some decent insulation or all sorts of things along those lines. Um, but then we still then, if that is the case, we still then need to, to work out exactly what we're going to need to heat the property. And it's going to make the problem worse in the sense of the high temperature systems, if you like, and condensing if we've actually reduced our heat load in the building. So we're going to be relying on a mixture of things, really. One is hydronic design, which I think we need to get the training on. Uh, and, and Kim's number one with that. The controls training that Richard is doing, I think we really need to get in, in, in to do that because they all work hand in glove with each other. Um, but the other point as well is I think that... Um, we can't just be in a heating industry and just learn about and know about heating. 
we need to have some kind of understanding on building structures and what the building materials are that make up these structures and what is a good and good quality build and what is a bad quality build you know i've seen people drilling holes through through walls and we've all done it i've been a gas engineer for 38 years you know i've drilled a hole through a wall with a core drill to put a flue pipe in as soon as i pulled the internal block out you know i'm covered in snow up to my knees where all the insulation's fallen out of the wall you know who puts that back in who does something about that and I've done on, the, on my training courses that I do, I've actually calculated out that, you know, three or four square meters of building fabric and what that then actually loses in watts per square meter. And it's horrendous, you know, so we can do so much more with just some very, very simple changes. We don't have to actually start physically taking out all of our systems. We can start changing what we've got right now with some very simple and cheap options. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, Rich, Rich, sort of nodding along, could I get you to, to, to build yep. on that? Yeah, I think so. So there's kind of a structure through, I mean, I mean, we should all be doing this as sort of basic commissioning of boilers anyway, but I don't think uh, I've been an installer a long time. I, I joined my mum and dad's business back in 2002. So when, when I joined my, their business, what I, what I understood out in the field was that commissioning wasn't being done very well. So benchmark books were just being filled out quite willy nilly. You'd always see 70, 50 or 55, you know, 75, 55 on the benchmarks. So there are some quite key things that we, we can do quite, quite cheap, inefficient, uh, you, know, um, you know, quite easy things to do. So, so first of all, like Rob said, is working out your heat loss requirement um, of the building and then setting. So some of the issues we have is we, we have like 24 kilowatt combis as the smallest combis we have. So the problem is if you're putting a 24 kilowatt combi in, you really need to tweak the heat inside because it's great on you know on, on hot water but heat inside we really need to be tweaking that down so range rating is really really um critical uh once you've range rated though there's there's the next step so then setting your pump speeds so i don't know many people that i talk to who effectively set their pump speeds but basically if you work out mass flow rate calculation which is basically a calculation in which you put the, the amount of kilowatts you need to flow into the system into and then it comes out with a liters per hour figure uh, once you know that you can set the pump speed okay um, so once you've set your pump speed then you'll have half a chance of actually balancing the radiator system because with a pump that's set to maximum you've got little or no chance of balancing that system properly just because the valves, the lock shield valves that we fit to our radiators, you just don't have the valve authority on them to have the correct flow rates through the radiators. And once you have a radiator which has a narrow DT, so when we talk about DT, we talk about the temperature difference from flow to return. When we have a narrow DT, we're actually just passing that energy that, we, that the boiler put in the system back out through the radiator system and back to the, back to the boiler. So if we put 20 degrees in, we need to take 20 degrees out. Otherwise, we're not putting the correct kilowatts into the system. Um, so then, so lock shields, they, they need really good valve authority. So if they're just flat plungers on a valve seat, that's not going to be very good valve authority because as you close them down to the correct flow rates, actually what happens is you get close, but you can't quite get close enough and you just give up where if you have a tapered valve seat configuration, like a conical seat going into the actual valve itself, then when you're adjusting that, you can get a lot, lot better valve authority. Um, but there's other things. So when we come to the controls, if we're fitting modulating controls on, on a boiler, so it's really key that that modulation technology just runs the boiler as long as it can for, for as long burn periods as it can and keeps the pump running around the system as long as it can. So the problem with TPI controls, is that it will, war it will work out proportionally how much energy needs to go in the system, but it can only ever put a fixed amount in. So the way it adjusts its output is by putting that amount of energy in for a short duration and then shutting the energy off. So say you need, I don't know, eight kilowatt, um, eight kilowatt hours of energy going into the system. If, if it is a 16 kilowatt boiler, it will run for half hour, if you know what I mean, to put eight, eight kilowatt hours in instead of 16 kilowatt hours into the system. So it will do half duration. But the way it does that is it on off controls. With modulation controls, what they actually do is reduce the flow temperature of the boiler, which changes the mean water temperature of the radiators, which adjusts the output that way. So what the boiler can do then is actually run at a lower flow temperature for a lot longer period. So over that hour, 
it might run at say eight kilowatts over that dur over that in uh, entire duration, rather than actually running at higher flow temperatures because it just doesn't know any different. Mm -hmm. So then it's it, it's important then to work around the controls, setting long anti-cycle times on the boilers where appropriate, and also setting like the end of demand window. So when you have a heat and control and it has a demand window, at the end of that demand window, have the boiler run a bit longer as well, just to push that energy through the system. So we're not having this start stop effect. We're not getting the energy out of the heat exchangers and, and we're just maximizing the boilers to run absolutely the best they can. So lower flow, lower flow temperatures, I'm not saying cold, certainly if we design a, a system at like 70 degrees with a 50 return, we're, we're now in condensing mode. We're not, we're not a lot in condensing mode, but it's better than 75, 55 and we're not, we're not condensing at all. Okay. Lots of, lots of great um, sort of tips and things that people can, can do. And maybe we'll try and summarize that, that later. Let's go to just, just Joe, your final sort of uh, thoughts on this about, you know, how do we, really raise the bar here, your thoughts on sort of training and, and best practice before we uh, open up to the floor? Well, I, I think that um, there's a recent PricewaterhouseCooper survey and it said that since lockdown, 60% of people are more engaged in their heating systems or, or energy efficiency anyway, since uh, than before lockdown. So I think there's just a huge opportunity for not just the installers, because that's putting a lot of burden on them or that, you know, that they can learn these methods and, and try and put them across in their sales pitch, but certainly from across the industry to try and just get some more helpful information out there that can guide consumers to, to make the right decisions. And um, I mean, I, we all appreciate that companies are, you know, looking after themselves and their employees and, you know, their targets and, and, that, and that's entirely natural. Um, but I think it just, it kind of, it is very opaque as far as the consumer is concerned because then they cannot see past the, the kind of marketing blurb to see what actually works. And, and by picking a nest and a, and, a, and a boiler that won't work within this, this modulation setting that they're not, not getting the best deal. So the opaqueness is kind of leading to bad, bad results for consumers. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, thanks, thanks to everyone for their thoughts there. We're going to go get, grab some questions from our, uh, from the audience now so keep feel free to send them through on the chat or the or the q a um function whatever's easiest for you well, just one quick quite interestingly just from chris uh sofa just now about um even just something as simple as the location of the uh thermostat um you know thinking you know how many think it should be in the lounge versus the hallway obviously you know we've all been sat there at the sofa at the end of a day we've been out of work and actually it's just the the small things like if it's something right there you can you can turn down that's perhaps easier than it being out in the hallway and you might you might get that but maybe i'll just ask any of the panelists to just reflect on that and any other you know behavioral yeah. nudges almost you know what can installers do to just really think about that um to make it's consumers question, lives easier it's a good question that chris raises and typically we've seen a lot in the past of uh, when the central heating systems got installed the that was in the hallway um, the, the heating would be ticking along and then someone would open the front door and it would go on full blast. Mm. Um, so I think you do need to take care of where the sensing is done for your master mm. sensor. If you've only got one room thermostat, obviously it needs to represent most of the house if, if possible. So traditionally they are in the hallway, but probably better to have them in the lounge as mm. a more representative area or, or even the kitchen. Mm. Ideally, you want more than one temperature sensing point in the house. You know, ideally, you'd have it in every single zone. Yeah. Every single room of the house up to, up to that. And Rich, is that what you were going to add on yeah. to that? Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. Single, if, you, if you've got a single zone controller in a property, you, you, need that, you need that to represent the entire house. So if you have it in the lounge, it's really important that the rest of the radiators throughout the property are, are, are of equal heat output to the lounge radiator especially with a modulation technology control, because what if you use like a class five control, what it will actually do is modulate to the temperature that it, it can see in that room. So if that then doesn't represent the rest of the house, then it, that could then mean some of the some of the uh, the other rooms in the property are not heated correctly and maybe mm. underheated. So so what you need to make sure if you are doing that is either the, the rooms in the rest of the house, particularly bedrooms are normally the ones that suffer uh, are correctly sized. Otherwise, otherwise it won't work. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let's go on to this sort of multiple zone controls. Now, um, another question um, that was from Chris as well uh, earlier is that 
Is there a risk then that the boiler will run for longer and be less efficient than having a single Zen control? If you've got all these different, yeah, it different can, rooms. Can, yeah. That can happen. So, I mean, but you've got to turn it on its head as well. So yes, that can happen. If you were to set with a multi-zone controller, if you were to set a bedroom at 30 degrees, the boiler's going to run until that room's satisfied. But if you turn it on, on its head, so imagine a home office situation where you would have to heat the whole property to have your mm. office heated. If you actually had a multi-zone control in that property, then you could just literally heat your office while you actually remotely shut off all the, all the other rooms. So they wouldn't heat to waste energy and just literally your office could, could you know, would be heated to the correct temperature. I mean, mm. interestingly enough with multi-zone control is that it's just the accuracy that it works on. It, it, it's working to half a degree accuracy, where if you think a single zone controller might be working to half a degree accuracy, but t existing like wax filled TRVs won't be anywhere near that, that amount, uh, you know, that efficiency rating. So it's kind of horses for courses, but, but yeah, if you do, if you do leave a modulation controller on in one room up to a higher temperature, then yes, it will run until that room temperature is satisfied. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Message from Rhiannon, lots of questions to email later. And yes, this will be available um, as a recording and we'll, we'll do our best to get our panelists will answer questions after this. If you do have to run to pick up kids from school, which is a nice um, sort of novelty thing that we all get to do uh, these days. But we've got a couple more here. We've got one from, uh, from Ross McKenzie. Um, will controls have more uh, API integration for electric time off use tariffs without having to use third party apps like if this, then that. Yeah, I, I can take that one. I can yeah, take that one. Yeah, that one, Rob. Um, this this comes under the whole section of what we call energy smart. Um, mm -hmm. So see, there's lots of talk about um, smart thermostats, you know, being related to app control or smart voice assistance. But really, what we're talking about with energy smart is where the controls are responding to energy company signals to either pause operating at times of high demand and cost or to switch on when grid demand is low or cost and carbon intensity is low. So absolutely, this is a huge, huge area of focus. It can be done today with existing integrations like IFT, um, and we're already seeing some great applications of that. There's, I was looking at the Evo Home IFT channel the other day, and there's an uh, orange um, octopus energy agile tariff applets already set up. Um, but yeah, answering the question that Ross has, has said, will the controls have API integration to allow um, demand side response? Um, yes, they will, Ross. Absolutely. It's mm -hmm. coming. And the more um, the, the uh, energy providers that come along with these agile tariffs that can look for grid signaling, that will all be baked in. Um, I've been working on some, some stuff for, for the next set of building regs where we're looking at all sorts of ways that these um, triggers uh, can be used. And you know, the, the power of pausing various um, loads at certain times of the day to help the grid when it's struggling as well is really, really powerful. So yeah, this is exactly uh, the area that it, the industry is looking at. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Um, anyone else? Uh, Pick up on that. We'll go, we'll go to a couple more questions before. Yeah, we'll, well, I use, well, I use IFTTT for my heating system. So, I mean, with, with the, the nice thing about some of the energy tariffs like Octal, uh, Octopus Agile um, is that you can uh, have it come on and supplement your existing gas heating as well. So potentially when the time of use tariff goes to a, a low point during the day, mm. it might actually be che cheaper and more uh, or, or less carbon intensive to bring on your immersion heater in your hot water cylinder, for instance, and shifting the load away from gas consumption, which you can do with the IFTTT um, API. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's really good integration. I mean, I use mine with a heat pump, um, but, but you know, you, there's no reason we can't do, uh, you, you know, multi, multi technology systems going forward, so, you know, and just modify the existing gas systems that we have. Okay. Okay, great. Th th thanks, Les. Um, question from Liam. We're back to sort of multi-zone uh, controls. Um, what impact does multi-zone control have on efficiency when the only zones calling are below the boiler's minimum output? Like more yeah, I, can, I can take Robert that Rich, Yeah, back to you. Uh, so there's been some university lab tests done on, on exactly this question, actually. 
Um, and we, we need to understand what we're, what we're meaning by the word efficiency. Because efficiency is different to gas consumption. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, zoned control basically reduces the amount of, of heat demand that's in the home, yeah? Because you're running different parts of the home at different, different temperatures. So by its very nature, zoning will reduce gas consumption. Right? It has to. Because basically you're basically miniaturizing the, the heat load. Um, the efficiency question is more in to do with the boiler efficiency, mm. and whether that boiler is running uh, in condensing. Now, certainly zoning can have an impact on, on condensing, because if the uh, heat demand is less than the boiler minimum output, um, the boiler will cycle. It, it's just inevitable. Um, and uh, this is why it's so important to do a, a proper analysis of, of the building heat loss on a room by room basis so that you know what you're trying to control. But, but even when um, you've got multi zoning and you're into less efficient operation of the boiler, you will use a lot, lot less gas. So in the university test of the University of Loughborough, we found that it was 14% uh, less gas consumption at a 2% trade off in efficiency. Mm -hmm. So even when you have a suboptimal installation um, that's not balanced in exactly the right way that, as Richard has, has described, where the boiler's all tuned in to its perfection, um, multi-zoning saves more money than it wastes. Okay, great. All right, thanks, thanks, thanks Rob. Um, one or two more questions, and then I'm going to get uh, a final kind of key takeaway, closing thought from all of our panellists. Um, from an anonymous attendee here, what about uh, technology? And you'll have to forgive me, uh, I probably don't know the acronyms for the tech like the GHHP and ASHP. Who knows um, yeah, what that question talking, must be about? Talking about heat pumps, yeah. Yeah. Um, Do we want to just give a very, very brief. I'm just trying to see the question. Can you just repeat that question, Ben? Yeah. It says, what about technology like GHSP and ASHP? I'm not sure, whoever asked it as well, if you want to give us some more uh, information about what you mean there, it's a little bit, perhaps a little bit vague. I think it's talking about heat that? pumps. Yeah, yeah, Rob, do you want to go for that? Yeah, Rob I think it's talking about, yeah, grain source and uh, heat pumps and air source heat pumps. Okay. So we, we, yeah, we, yeah. we tackled these on the last, uh, last installer panel. Um, absolutely the, the heating appliances of, of the future uh, alongside uh, decarbonized gas, whether it's uh, biogas or hydrogen. Um, but yeah, much more and more interest in, in uh, heat pumps these days. Um, and the good news is that the controls that you're used to using, um, once they've been applied in the right way, with critically the right attention to detail on the radiator system and underfloor heating with the right balancing and sizing. Um, mm. The controls that you know and love today will work with heat pumps. So with the Residio stuff, all of the T-series thermostats uh, in Evo Home, and Evo Home's just about to be improved even further uh, with additional support for heat pumps and heating and cooling applications. Yeah. So okay. today's technology is all ready for tomorrow. We've been working on it to make sure that that's the case. Yeah, do that. And, uh, and the other, other Rob, did you want to have a Yeah, just quick um, word on that? I'd just like to add that, I mean, you know, this new technology is absolutely fantastic. I think we've got to be very, very careful about as we move to, um, to heat pumps. Heat pumps are a fantastic technology, as you're saying, but they, they, they demand decent design on the system. If you like, they're not as forgiving as gas boilers are in any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, on, on, as, a, as a design consultant that I've done for, for a few years now is, is the amount of properties that I've gone to where they've been wrongly installed onto um, um, existing uh, gas network pipe work systems, you know, like DT20 systems. Um, they simply don't work and it costs the clients an awful lot more money to use. Yeah, the control side of it, I, I, I totally agree with what Rob and Richard say, say about this. That's, that's all in, all in, in place. But, but again, what's happening with the understanding of heat pumps is that people, when they're sizing these correctly, they're sizing them like three times smaller than they are with gas, with gas boilers. You know, so your average, your best selling heat pump is like a 10 kilowatt unit. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's tiny in comparison to your, to, to your 30 kilowatt heat only, um, which is a bit interesting. But it, it's also, it's like, it's that, it's that saying, isn't it? You know, if you're, if you're 
a boiler or a heat source is not like a car. You can't just jump in it and go naught to 60 in three, in three seconds. It doesn't, it's not designed to do that. And we've gone from the stage now, we need to move away from the inefficient, you know, heat up our buildings in a short time, you know, with mm -hmm. great big uh, uh, heat exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. We now design at low temperatures to heat for a long time. And that's where heat pumps are coming in. You're going to get your best SCOT figures or your best efficiency figures out of these units at the lower temperatures that you're running, which is all about the calculation and all about the design. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks, Rob. And there was, yeah. Sorry. Go on, Jay. I was just going to add to that. I think that we shouldn't, I, I hope there's not a rush to see heat pumps as a kind of quick fix that we overlook the simple changes that, that we can make now. And, and, and I think that the training, getting the training right for gas boilers to work at low temperatures just tees everything up really nicely. We have a legacy of boilers that are working optimally and we have a, an upskilled workforce that understood low temperature gas boilers, therefore understand um, low temperature systems from heat pumps and, and ground mm. yeah. yeah, it's really It's really important that training, you know, like, like Kim, I, I think Kim should just have a bit of a say about, you know, getting this stuff right because especially with with heat pumps we're going from gas boilers which we're not we're not getting right i'm guilty of it myself when i was an install you know initially as an installer um obviously all the groups were on social media and everything else so we push that forward the training and everything else that's going on at the moment lots of people have attending kim's course um and it just gives you that extra bit of knowledge that you need to make sure that these changes and these this, this system tuning boiler tuning uh, getting the controls right and everything else is just is just put in place Brilliant. Yeah. Tim, Kim? Yeah. So the good thing about the hydronics training is, is that it's relevant to all things. It's a bit like Ohm's law. It's never going to change. Uh, flow and velocity and this sort of thing is going to be the same, whatever heat source we've got. So whatever flow we need, whatever DT we have, we can easily amend the figures to get the right size uh, pipes, uh, so on and so forth. And I, think, I know some of the guys struggle a bit because most of our engineers are sort of hands-on guys. Uh, but really, the, there's only a couple of really simple formulas that you need to understand to be able to get this dead right. And I try and say all the time, all through the day, you know, from today onwards, we don't need to guess anything. We can use a couple of these simple formulas and we can work out exactly the right answer. We don't need to look at what somebody else has done or look at what's always been done in the past. We can actually make our own decisions based on some maths. And I know one of Rob's favourite expressions is, the maths never lie. And he's absolutely right. If the maths sack up, uh, you can rest assured that whatever it is, that isn't going to be the problem. Uh, the one day's training, I'll, we've just done a, a questionnaire which has been really handy. Uh, some really, really useful information come back. Uh, and we're going to act on that. We're going to split the course into two. Um, and we're going to do a two-day course and a, a one-day course with emphasis on different aspects. If people want to particularly you know, align, people particularly want to follow. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned that people aren't put off that they think it's really difficult. It, 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 if you want to be a design consultant like Rob, then yeah, you need a tall forehead. But, <laughs> but to work out just the simple stuff, you know, just the everyday stuff we need to do on site, it really isn't a biggie. It's just a couple of simple formulas that you can do easily on a, on a calculator on your phone. And I'll say to these guys, you don't need the 10 decimal points that you get on your phone. You know, just one decimal point is, is more than adequate. It isn't, it isn't a big, we can, we can, if we can just get people to realize that they need to know it and that it isn't difficult, a lot of this problem could go away and this killer, killer what thing, we can really get to grips with it. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Um, any more questions? Do fire them in. If not, uh, absolutely. There's a recording and we'll be able to kind of, any questions that we get uh, on that video, we'll be able to try and get them, Rob and, uh, and, and the guys and, Girls here to, 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 to get back to you. Um, let's just sit, go round the, round the group for kind of a key message to take away um, then here. Maybe, uh, Joe, could I possibly uh, sort of start with you um, with this? Yes. Um, well, I'll go back to that same stat of 60% of people are more interested in, the, in you know, energy conservation um, mm. through lock and, and before, prior to lockdown. And I just think there's never been a better time for installers to, I mean, undertake a lot of self learning and, and that's hard when you're, when you're working. Um, but I think those that are practicing at this level have shown that that is kind of what it takes to get there at, at the moment. Um, but if you're taking on that learning and then you're managing to convey that over to the consumer, I think, you know, they're, they're open to those messages and 
um, I think that certainly for, you know, across the industry, prices have been dropping for some time, as we all know, but the guys that are doing it anecdotally, I know, do better, you know, they can maintain their day rates and, um, and they can um, build a, a very reputable business based on the concepts that we've talked about here. Mm. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Rich, Rich, could I come to you next? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's think about the design. So think about the boilers you're putting in. Are they suitable for the application you're trying to put them in? Um, think about the controls a lot more. You know, the controls are out there. Whether it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not fussed whether it's manufacturer controls or whatever, but, but really with modern condensing boilers, uh, you, need, you need modulation controls. If, we, if we're fitting them with on-off controls, uh, which is a massive proportion of the market still at the moment, you're really, you're, you're not really doing the boiler any justice or, or the homeowner. Um, the, you know, there are some fundamental issues with, uh, unfortunately, you've got to unlearn all the bad, all the bad stuff in the past. So customers used to radiators heating up in five minutes. And if the radiator is not 80 degrees off the wall, then it's not, it, you know, the system's not working. The modulation controls, you know, they work out the air temperature correctly and modulate the boiler to its most efficient point at all times. So um, look into them and invest in them. That would be my, my best advice and, and get trained on them. So mm -hmm. and, to, yeah, yeah. A bit of education and training uh, all around. Um, um, Rob Berridge, would you, would you go next? Yeah, it's, it's, some, it's a kind of difficult conundrum for people to get into now. I mean, I think we're in one of the most exciting times of the heating industry in the whole of it so since its conception 50, 60 years ago. I think, I think it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I, I, I really sympathise with guys because, you know, at the end of the day, I've, I've been a coalface engineer for years and trying to, trying to get time off to go and do all these courses and pay the money out and lose your uh, daily, daily rates and stuff like that is a nightmare, especially if you've got family and mortgage and everything else to pay and things with lockdown now and people not earning as much. I mean, it is a nightmare. The only thing that I would say is, is that I was of that view all the time and I was working, you know, seven days a week sometimes and all sorts of things like that. Once I actually got my head into some of the calculations and started to work out what was correct and what was doing very, very quickly, I found myself getting much, much more lucrative work and much more enjoyable work. And there's a little saying that I always say, this is no rehearsal this life. You know, if you're not enjoying what you're doing and you're not getting the best out of it, don't waste your time. Go and do something that you really want to get into and really want to involve yourself with. The, the calculations of the mathematics are already, have always been there. You know, it's up to you to go and learn them. And if you want to get better at what you're doing and earn more money, do it. Mm. Because, it, you know, if I can do it, anyone can do it. It's as simple as that. There's no, no doubt about that. You're putting yourself down there, Rob. But levelling up, absolutely, and using this as a great opportunity and a, no, never a better time. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, Kim, can I come to you and then... Um, yeah, to be honest, I think Rob absolutely said it dead right. You know, you pay a price for education, but you reap the rewards tenfold over, I think. Even just if it, having the confidence to know that you're doing it right uh, and the confidence to try new things that you haven't done before because you can have a little play with the maths and you're not, you're not just guessing and hoping for the best, especially when it comes to things like pump sizing, uh, and I know we're talking about radio sizing and, and, and boiler sizing, but even pump sizing on some of the bigger uh, systems, it's nice to know that's the pump I need. I don't need to buy that one that's three times too big, just in case I can buy the right one. And everyone's a winner. Customer pays less, you've got the right uh, piece of kit first time, uh, and it's going to work. It's, it's always about education. Uh, I think Rob really knows mm. that. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, thanks Kim. Um, uh, and, and Rob? Rob Whitney, um, last final thoughts? Yeah, it's just really what the takeaway we wanted from today is, is a really simple message and I'm just going to read it out. Um, so really, obviously, for the new installs, there's lots you can do in, with all the sizing and heat loss calcs and everything. But for retrofit, you know, the, the simple message is even without addressing insulation and radiator sizing, there's significant gains can be achieved by better boiler tuning system balancing and advanced controls. Load and weather compensation controls will intelligently run the appliance at lower temperature where possible and lower percentage burner output um, for longer periods and lower temperatures. And this will maximize condensing efficiency. Maximizing condensing efficiency is what it's all about, guys. We've been installed in um, condensing boilers for nearly 20 years and a lot of the time they're not condensing, so we need to change that. Mm -hmm.
Great. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Rob. And, and thanks all to all the panelists, to Kim, uh, Rob, Rob, Rich and Joe for joining us today. Uh, we've had lots of great questions from, from everyone and, and also compliments from the people on, uh, who've been watching this on, on the usefulness and practicalness of, of, of some of the tips and, and great ideas and things to take away there. So thank you guys for your time and thank you to everyone uh, listening uh, and watching this whether watching live or, or watching later, it will be um, again sort of on, on the installer website and we'll send this round. So, you know, if you've got other questions that come up, then, then please do drop us an email and we'll get, um, do our best efforts to get these, you know, the panelists and the guys to, to answer them for you and, and stay in touch. But thanks everyone. Thanks for your time. Um, hope to see you again on, a, on another webinar like this soon. Thanks then guys. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye.